Well, good morning. I thank you for the opportunity to come this morning and, and give my testimony. Um, it certainly is a joy for me to be able to give it. I hope that it's an encouragement and a hope for those that, that uh, came out of the Catholic Church or that have family that are still Catholics. Um, you know, my experience is not totally unique, but it's still an experience that I'd like to share and, and uh, want to give you that testimony. First of all, to start off with, I come from a long family of Catholics, uh, at least on my mom's side. We go back many, many generations. In fact, we go back uh, into the Middle Ages, uh, where we can trace uh, family to family uh, passing down of Catholicism. And uh, we even have a saint, a canonized official saint in the family. Uh, his name is Oliver Plunkett. He's the patron saint of Ireland. Uh, he was canonized in 1975, and uh, he lived back in the 1600s, in the, in the 17th century, from uh, 1629 to 1681. His claim to fame was uh, he was basically an archbishop for Ireland, uh, and it was going on in a very tumultuous time uh, in, that, in Europe, basically. Uh, there was a lot of cracking down on Catholicism, and uh, England was really going after Catholics, and... Uh, a plot came about, a con concocted plot called the Popish Plot. Go look it up sometime. There was basically a guy that, that uh, made up that the Catholics were going to bring in a bunch of assassins to assassinate the king and do all this uh, nefarious stuff. And so this caused a big crackdown on Catholicism, and it eventually affected my family member, Oliver Plunkett. Look him up sometime. Uh, basically, he was brought in and tried uh, for treason, and was hung, drawn, and quartered uh, in London. He was the last Catholic martyr for, for England. Uh, and he was the, the final uh, fatality of the Popish plot uh, after it was all uncovered. So, uh, and the effects of that are still being felt today. Uh, Parliament over there had to enact something in the 1800s to ease the persecution of the Catholics over there because of uh, the sentiment that was going on from, from back then. So, uh, very robust Catholic family. If you would like to, you may... Uh, visit my deceased relative's head. Uh, he is displayed in a cathedral in uh, Ireland, and uh, it's a, basically a mummified head in a glass box with gold ornaments all around it. Uh, they take the head out into the city streets uh, about once a year, and they parade him about on the shoulders of men, uh, just like the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there are various other body parts of his that are revered and venerated all over pretty much all over the world. I mean, he was hung, drawn, and quartered, so he was put into at least five pieces. And uh, it's hard to say how many more they, they split him up into, but people gathered up his remains and carried him off, and, and they've been kept all this time as, as tokens of, of worship, basically. You know, people go and they pray in front of my dead relative's head, and they seek uh, for grace, they seek for all sorts of things that they're not going to find through a dead man's head. And, and I don't say that to offend anybody, but... Uh, the fact of the matter is that's not how you find God, is through the, the bones and the skin of dead men. Um, he is a canonized saint now, as I mentioned. He was canonized back in 1975. And knowing that actually led to a lot of my investigation of Catholicism and my own spiritual state. Uh, back in 2005, I was in an auto accident that led to a lot of health issues that culminated in, in about 2009, 2010, that made me want to just die. I had reached the end of my rope. There was no more that medical science could really do for me. So on a, on a desire to just end it, I said, God, just take my life. Just end me now. But as I'm saying that, I want to know where I end up when I die. I'm not foolish enough to say, I'm going to go on a trip, but I don't know where I'm going. Uh, I at least want to know where I'm going to end up. I want to have an end plan. And uh, when I started to think about these things, I didn't have any peace. I didn't have peace that I could actually be with God in heaven. I didn't have peace that I could have uh, reprieve from my pain and suffering. I didn't have that peace. And certainly knowing that an uncle of mine, or not an uncle, uh, a family member of mine from a long time ago, took until 1975 for a pope, the leader of the Catholic Church, to say, you are now a saint. You are officially in heaven concocting miracles for people. I didn't feel like that I had the time or the ability to actually create a loving fan base, so to speak, to get me voted into sainthood after I died. And it, and it looks like that's really the crux of, of becoming a saint, is you have to be very popular. And he was popular, my, my deceased family member, Oliver Plunkett. He, 
He was very well loved in Ireland. He was on the run for many, many years from the government that was trying to arrest him, and he found, uh, you know, he found people that would take care of him, and, and he just basically was in hiding. But the whole country loved him. He is the patron saint of Ireland now, the whole country. And I don't have that. I have a few people that really like me. And beyond that, there's not going to be a lot of people after my death saying, we need to make Jeff a saint. Look at these miracles that have been done in his name. Like That wasn't going to happen. I knew that. But I didn't have the time to do that. So that ultimately meant that I was going to have a long stay in purgatory, I had a feeling. But I wanted to know how long it was going to be. I, when I read about uh, the indulgence selling, which, you know, they did that in air. But the fact that you could buy an indulgence in the Middle Ages for a thousand years or 10,000 years, or buy multiple indulgences for multiple thousands of years. The fact that you could buy indulgences to equal a million years or a billion years started me thinking, if I'm only going to live on this earth for 30 years, why do I need to live in purgatory suffering worse than now you know, to be able to make it to heaven? It didn't make any sense to me, and it, and it just didn't seem right. And so I started reading, I started reading. Uh, I read the Council of Trent, I uh, read the Church Fathers, I went through and I saw this change happening. You know, the early writers said, you must be submissive to the Pope to be saved. You must be a member of the Catholic Church to be saved. You must uh, accept the Mass or your anathema. All these things came out of Trent, and yet today, they call people who aren't Catholic but call themselves Christians separated brethren. That's not near as offensive as heretic, uh, anathema, you know, accursed, you know, you need to die, basically. You know, that was the early sentiment. Now it feels a little different. Yet none of those old things have actually been redacted or changed or, or edited. They all still stand. They still feel that about us today. We're still anathema. We're still heretics and schismatics and all that. All that still applies, but they don't use those words anymore. And that got me thinking, why is this different? If we are the one true church and we stand up for what's right, we punish what's wrong, why are we making changes like this? And so, after reading the stuff from Vatican II, and just, it, it just didn't feel right anymore. It felt wrong. It felt like they were waffling on the truth. I felt like I couldn't know full truth. I felt like since I wanted to know for sure I could go to heaven, that I was actually sinning doing that. They said that's the sin of presumption. You are presuming yourself to know something that no one on earth is allowed to know. That's what they would tell us. You know, the fact that a pope can't even know for sure that they're going to be in heaven when they die. They might go to purgatory, they might make it straight through. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of variables. Not for the Christian life as described in the Bible. There is a, there is a moment you become a saint and you know you are heaven bound. You know that's going to be your home and that's the kind of peace that I was looking for. But I could not find it with, you can't say for sure. If you say for sure you're saved, you've sinned and you're going to hell. What kind of confounded logic is that? To tell people that to be sure of their salvation, that condemns them. That's preposterous, and it's of the most damnable things out there. You know, God wants us to know for sure we're saved. He wants us to have that peace, that you may know you have eternal life. That's the problem with Catholicism, is they, they, just, they want you coming to them for your food, and not coming to the true word of God for your meat. Okay? And that's, that's something that I know now, that I learned through this process. But before I knew that, I knew nothing. I, I, I felt like I had been lied to my whole life. There was nothing that I believed that I knew why I believed it. I just kind of was born, taught stuff, and I believed it, but I didn't know why. I didn't, I didn't have the ability to trace back everything I knew and say, I know that because it's true, and I can prove it. Couldn't do it. And that really shook me to the core. And... And ultimately, uh, I ended up just basically leaving Catholicism altogether. Just said, they're not true. I don't know what true is then. So I, I, I read through uh, the different religions of the world, uh, studied some of them, didn't really practice any of them. But pretty quickly, I could feel like they're, they're not even making a claim that they have all truth. They say they have some truth, but I felt like there needs to be an ultimate truth. If there is a God of the universe, he will have definitively put something down that says this is what's true, Compare things to this. And that's what I was looking for. And I could not find it in, in any other practice. Any other religious practice seemed to focus on me. And I already proved myself to be a failure. And to be at a point where I was absolutely destitute of any grace. And, 
and it was just this, you know, guy ready to die. I knew for a fact I couldn't do a religion that relied on me to make it happen. So, just absolutely failing to understand what I could do, I cried out to God a little bit, I just a little whimper. Uh, help me, if you're there, help me get a grasp of what life is all about. And pretty quickly, I was pointed to the Bible. I thought, well, okay, if the Bible's true and it's just Catholicism that misinterprets it, because after all, they say the Bible's the Word of God, but they also say tradition and, and what they teach is the Word of God. They literally teach that what the Pope says ex cathedra is like the Word of God. So if they just got that part wrong, what if the Bible's still true? I have to give it another go. I started reading the Bible. I started to see some things, but it was confusing because it didn't mesh up with what I believed Catholicism to teach, and so I was unsure for a while of what actually was true. And so I went back and I started studying something. Uh, I wanted to study what I learned from the Bible from the Catholics. Did they teach me anything that was true? And the, the answer is yes. I learned about the Trinity. I learned about the deity of Jesus. I, I learned about the, the virgin birth. I learned, I learned many key doctrines that I need today. But I also learned a lot of stuff that I don't need. I, I had learned that I was saved when I was a baby when I got sprinkled. And I know that's not true. I got saved when I believed and put my faith and trust in Jesus and his sacrifice for me. And it was, it was that realization that saved me and not the pouring of water or even my dipping that I did later. Um, but I, I wanted to go through and so I knew since we read the Bible in Mass, we did read the Bible. We had readings uh, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from the Psalms, from the Gospels. We did all that. And it was done on a three-year rotation Cycle A, cycle B, cycle C. And essentially there's a, a pre-picked chunk of readings that goes from each cycle. And they all kind of have a sympathetic feel to them. They've thought about it a little bit. But there's something interesting. There's a misconception out there among Catholics that by going to Mass, you get the whole Bible in, in the three-year rotation. If you went to Mass every single day for three years, you still wouldn't get the whole Bible. You would miss out on a vast majority of it. You'd get about three quarters of the New Testament if you went every day, all year, for three years, and you'd get a very lower percentage of the Old Testament. Don't quote me on this, I think it's less than 50%, I'd have to look it up again. But bottom line is, you're missing a lot of stuff. I mean, this is a pretty big book, and if you just cut it in half and throw it out to somebody, they're gonna miss something, especially with this other detail uh, in mind. These readings that are read out of the Bible, they are not complete, contiguous readings, chapter 19. It's not done that way. Case in point, uh, in the book of Acts, you all would turn to the book of Acts. I will show you something that ultimately God used to the saving of my soul. And it was uh, in my study of these readings. I noticed that they would say, uh, in this example, Acts chapter 2, verse 14, comma, 22 through 30. What's in that middle chunk right there, do you suppose? What's in that comma space there? Why wouldn't they read those, those verses that are in between their comma and their next verses? And that happens a lot. It's, it's well over half the time uh, a reading is going to be modified in some way to not be complete. Uh, it's just a, an alarming percentage of time. And ultimately, what they did was skip over in Acts chapter 2, these verses. It started with verse 14, so they do read this. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Hearken to my words. You know, he even says, Listen to what I'm about to say. And they skip it. And they jump over and they say to verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. It's almost like he's repeating himself. Why would he repeat himself? He's not. There's stuff in between that's important. And it says, uh, as it goes on and, and, and gives a little more information, here's what's missing with the last verse of this being the most important. Peter says here in verse 15, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall, see, uh, shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, 
blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. And before that great and notable day of the Lord come. But this is the verse that, that came out to me and got me reading other verses. It says in verse 21 of Acts chapter 2, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I believed it. I just believed it. For the first time, I actually believed what it said simply. I, I didn't have anything else to go off of. I, I just believed it. And from that point on, God just started revealing himself in his word and, and building me up and, and showing me all these doctrines and, and allowing me the, the opportunity to deconstruct the lies and the falsehood and all the nonsense that was not uh, beneficial to my growth, to my spiritual health, to anything, uh, to life, godliness, anything. It all got suppressed that wasn't true. And God started building me back up. And it's been a long process and I'm definitely still not done. And, and I'm the lowest of low on the totem pole. But I'm saved. And I know that. And I can sleep soundly each night knowing that I'm saved and that I don't have to earn anything to get into heaven. That if I tried to earn anything to get into heaven, God would actually reject it. The fact that I would bring anything to him and say, here's my filthy rags, would you take them? He'll throw them away. But if I rely on what Jesus did, I'm accepted. This is, I mean, it's virtually insane. And that's what most people think. They think that the simplicity of what this Bible teaches is insane, unbelievable, and, you know, almost contemptible. But it's not. It's the grace of God to salvation for, for all them that believe. And, and ultimately, that, I think that sums up my testimony most of all. Is God took me from a guy who was a sinner to begin with, you know, I wasn't just Catholic. I was a bad guy to begin with. Uh, I made many, many mistakes in my life, and, uh, and I'm grateful that God had the foresight to know that I would need him and that he would send his son for me and would die on the cross for my sins and, and would you know, invite me with a free gift to live with him in heaven. And, it's, and I mean, it's amazing, but here on earth, it's amazing to know that I'm forgiven. And I'm glad I know that, and uh, praise God for it.